Hey there folks, it's Jimmy Stewart here, hoping this is finding you all doing well. And a very happy Veterans Day to all the vets out there. Now this video today is going to be episode number five of the classic Vintage Guitar Week here on the channel. And this is a special one because this was voted on by you. When a few days ago I asked you what guitar you would like to see for the next upcoming episode, which is this one. And the majority of you voted for the oldest guitar that I own. So without further ado, let's have a look at this guy right here. Now this, as far as I can tell, because these get tough to uh, establish dates on. They weren't using serial numbers back then. But uh, with all the information I've been able to find, this is a 48 a 1948 Rickenbacker lap steel modeled NS, or the S as they called it. This was designed by uh, a guy named George Buchamp. I think his name is Buchamp, that's how we pronounce it. Anyway, he was uh, working at National String Instrument Corporation, National String Instrument Corp, back around 1927, 1928 when they started National. And he met Adolf Rickenbacker. So Adolf Rickenbacker had started the Rickenbacker Manufacturing Corporation in Santa Ana, California, and he was making and building metal bodies, metal tricones for the National Instrument Corporation, which was just right down the street from him. And he had met a guy named John Doyera, and John was actually working at National as well. So those guys all kind of got together. They were a little disenchanted with what was going on at National. The instruments were expensive and, and tough to make, and they weren't selling all that well. Remember, this was, you know, uh, the Great Depression time frame. So they all decided to get together, and they started a company um, in 1931. And the original 1931 company that Adolf and George uh, Buchamp started was called Ro Patton Corporation. And the first guitar that the Ro Pat in Corp came out with was dubbed the frying pan. It was a long neck guitar with a circular body like this one here and they dubbed it the frying pan. So that is credited really today, even today, as the first commercially manufactured electric guitars, although it was a lap steel like this one. I know a lot of people credit Les Paul with coming out with the first electric guitar, but his was the log and it was quite a bit a time after uh, Rickenbacker had come out with these lap steels. So the frying pan is really considered today as the first mass produced commercially available electric guitar in 1931. Now you'll see later in the up close video, this has actually got the Rickenbacker with the H and the Electro on the plate. Now, Adolf Rickenbacker, who was of Swiss descent, uh, was born in 1887, came over to the United States around 1918. And right around that time frame, he changed his name from the H spelling to the K spelling. Now he formed Rickenbacker Manufacturing Company in 1927. So around 1929, John Dopier resigned from National and started the Dopro Corporation, as we know today, Dopro Guitars. So around 1933, they changed the name to Electro Stringed Instruments, and a little bit later on, added the Rickenbacker to that logo as a honor to their founding and principal member at that time, Adolf Rickenbacker. And because they did that, they actually used the older spelling of his name with the H instead of the K. So in the 1940s, they actually were making the guitars with an amp, sort of like a little combo. And Ralph Robinson uh, was the designer of those amps. They had about four different models at the time. Now Rickenbacker was making these types of guitars, the lap steels, all the way up prior to the beginning of World War II, and then they ceased production. So the Guitars before then were a little bit different than these, and then obviously these are the post-war guitars. This is the NS100. It's a post-war, and you can tell those in a couple of different ways. 
The biggest difference would be in the size of the pickup. Now this original horseshoe pickup, again designed by George uh, and patented, now this one on this particular guitar is an inch and a quarter. Another way to tell the difference whether it's a pre-war or a post-war guitar is the pre-war guitars, the strings mounted in the back through the body. And they were mostly bakelite, sort of a hardened type of plastic, almost like a bowling ball. These post-war guitars are a stamped out of a sheet metal and they mount the strings from the top of the body. The very early models didn't have any volume and tone controls, and then some of them had a volume, and then they'd go to a volume and a tone on opposite ends of the guitar, and then finally, post-war, they started adding the volume and tone on the same side of the guitar. And then they also, post-war, included a height adjustment for the horseshoe pickup. The early models did not have a height adjustment. Another way to tell uh, the actual year, because they do get confusing, was around 48 is when they changed to the white fret marker dots. You can see on mine I'm missing just a few. They tend to fall inside the guitar. But they changed them to white, whereas the earlier models, the 46 and 47, had black dots on here. And another way to, to uh, check your year. Now I've read and I've seen on some of these that sometimes they would fill these and stuff these with newspapers. And a lot of people pull the magnets out and pull these pickup out and check the newspaper inside to get an actual date. I'm pretty sure this is a 48. Maybe at some time I'll pull this all out of here. I'll check inside here to see if it's stuffed with newspaper. And if it is, we'll get a good date of that. Now you'll see on mine that it is a square neck. It is a horseshoe pickup, one and a quarter inches wide. Again, it was post-war, they went to a one and a quarter. The pre-war guitars had a one and a half inch horseshoe pickup. The body on this came into sort of a sunburst gray. It's kind of a gray with a lighter piece here. And then you'll also notice that on mine, I do not have the original tuning keys. The original tuning keys were completely missing when I got this, and I got this in the early 80s. So I installed Grover's on mine. So not the original keys. I put Grover's on here. So let me give you an up-close video on the 48 Rickenbacker NS lap steel. So this is the up-close and personal of the Rickenbacker lap steel. As you can see, it's kind of a gunmetal gray burst, I guess you could call it. And there's the Rickenbacker with the H spelling, electro decal on top. The early ones had a plate there, and you can see the holes that were still drilled in the body for the plate, although they did go to a, a, a uh, emblem. There's that one and a quarter inch horseshoe pickup the standard instrument jack. Again, this body is stamped out of sheet metal. And you can see the gunmetal gray burst. The neck going up. And there's those grovers that I put on. Now here's the original case that I got with this guitar. This is all the way back from 1948. Still has the handle on there. Leather handle. And inside there was a couple of surprises as well. It still had the original plug guitar cable. The original slide bar. That's pretty neat. Pretty heavy, too. And the original uh, finger pick is also in there. I never used it because it's a little small for my finger. Where is it at? There it is. Pretty neat. 
And here's another little special surprise for you is when I got the guitar later on, my uncle actually gave me the amp that goes with it. Just brought it over to the house and I'll show you that real quick too. This I believe is a 48 or it could be a 46. And here it is here again, uh, a gunmetal gray burst with the original leather handle on the top. Now these amps were again uh, manufactured back in the 40s. They had a single input there as you can see. There's no tone, no volume. You just plugged in and went. With a speaker designed by James Lansing and some of you might recall him, uh, JBL speakers. Another interesting side bit on these was Right down the street from Rickenbacker was a little repair shop run by a guy named Leo Fender. And he was getting his start in the music business by repairing these amps, believe it or not, back in the day. A little serial number on there, but I couldn't read it. So that's how Leo Fender gets tied into this whole thing, too. Interesting stuff. So there's the little Rickenbacker amp. So, there it is, folks. The 1948 Rickenbacker lap steel model NS, or the model S. So Rickenbacker was making these all through the 30s, and then he stopped, obviously, for World War II, and then the 40s, right up to around 1950, where this was discontinued. And now, in the 50s, they decided to go ahead and sell, uh, and he sold the company to F.C. Hall, who purchased Rickenbacker Company in 1953, and... Obviously, they started making the hollow body guitars and all those kinds of things and the 12 strings and all that stuff in the late 50s, early 60s, which we're all familiar with now from bands like the Beatles and the Birds and you name it. Everybody was playing those guitars back in the early 60s. So that's going to do it for today, folks. It's Jimmy Stewart saying so long. Please take care of yourselves. Please stay healthy. Thank you so much for those who have subscribed to the channel. I really do appreciate that. And if you haven't subscribed, please consider doing so. I'd really appreciate it. And until next time, it's Jimmy Stewart saying so long, and we'll talk to you again very, very soon. Bye-bye for now, folks.